Gravity, The Hangover, Attitude is Everything, The Kid in the Green Jersey, Hate. Gravity seemed to be working particularly well that Saturday morning, like twice as powerfully as normal. My legs, my arms, even my head all felt heavy. My spikes, when I took them from my bag, felt like they were full of loose change. My gray cotton sweats with the number two inked under the chin seemed lined with lead. I felt, should I lie down on the cool grass under our tent, as if I would sink gradually into the earth. I wished I could. If I disappeared, absorbed into the dirt, I wouldn't have to race. You all made your beds, said Coach as we moped around our camp like the walking dead. Now you're going to have to lie in them. It was a particularly cruel metaphor. As we stretched in our circle of seven before the race, the mood was bad. The day before, there had been a neutral emptiness following the drama of our epic clash out at the Lamberth farm. Now the ugly hangover had truly begun. Yost behind was bruised and raw. Bowden's eye and cheek were turning yellow and purple. All the seniors save Yost rubbed their necks and shoulders and complained of soreness from slamming into Grandpa's net. The day fit our mood as well. It was cold and gray and windy. It was a great morning to spend at home in your bed under the warmth of your blankets. It was an awful morning to strip down nearly naked and push your body to its limits for 16 or 17 minutes of agony. I wish I was dead, said Slade. I wish you guys weren't a bunch of idiots, said Victor bitterly. He was mad. The only one of us who'd had anything approaching a normal week, Victor resented our sleepy sullenness. I wish you'd pull your shit together. We had a chance to win this before you guys acted like a bunch of tools all week. We could still win it, said Swart, but a huge yawn escaped him as he said it, which suggested otherwise. Right, said Victor, and you got laid last night. Attitude is everything is the saying. You may not be able to control anything else, but you're always in charge of your own mental approach to the task at hand. I kept telling myself that, but it seemed when I attempted to force myself to be upbeat, to get aggressive, I couldn't control how much my eyelids seemed to weigh. They kept shutting on me. Coach stood hands on hips at the first mile mark. He didn't say a word. He didn't have to. His face said it all. I'd never seen the man look angry before then. I'd seen him happy, sad, frantic, insane, worried, excited, on and on, but never angry. That day, I swear, there was actual steam coming out of his ears. Victor led us through the first mile on a slow 5.10. The problem was the rest of the contenders in the conference ran a quick 4.57. We were never even in it. I have to admit, I let Slade beat me that day. We were both running like crap somewhere in the middle of the pack. It was clear we weren't going to win the race, and it was clear I wasn't going to come near a PR. In that last mile when it feels like a grind in any race, if you're running poorly, it's tempting to just take your foot off the gas and cruise home with as little pain as possible. And that was exactly what I did. That was why I saw it all unfold before me. The kid in the green jersey was a complete victim of circumstance. How could he know the guy sprinting to the finish line beside him was a completely certifiable nut job? How could he know that the guy had been up and down, getting no sleep, plotting and planning violent deeds all week, and was now at the end of his rope? How could he know the guy came from a long line of psychos? He couldn't. That's why I don't blame him for pushing Slade in the finish shoot after they'd crossed the line together. He couldn't have known that he was playing the role of the smoking line of gunpowder to Slade's pile of TNT. He couldn't know he was the pin and Slade was the grenade. In the end, it didn't matter. He lost his teeth just the same. Blood sprayed on my chest and throat when the kid's head snapped back. A long red streak stretched across my white singlet from where his face had brushed against me as he fell backwards. I nearly tripped on him as he sat dumbfounded in the chute in front of me, spitting out his own teeth. And then I did fall as I was pushed hard from the side. I looked up from my spot on the ground to see a tall man with black hair and a gray beard. The man wore jeans and a brown leather jacket and big heavy boots. The man had taken my spot in the chute. 
He was punching Jeff Slade in the face, and Slade was punching him back. I was scrambling to get away when Slade kneed the man in the groin. I was several feet away from the fight when the man got Slade in a headlock and punched him repeatedly in the face, holding him there, punching him over and over again. Even though I was doing my best to evacuate the scene, I was still close enough to hear Slade's shouts, and I was close enough to realize Jeff Slade, tough guy psycho and team captain, was crying like a four-year-old, and I was close enough to see the bright red blood on the man's fist, Slade's blood, from where he'd broken Slade's nose with one of his punches. I was close enough to hear Slade screaming over and over again, I hate you, Dad. I hate you. 